It's common to experience a range of emotions throughout your financial journey. Depending on your circumstances, you may feel anxious, stressed, fearful, or guilty. At other times, you can feel empowered, hopeful, or at peace. What you feel could be just as complex as what you're going through. I'm your host, Melissa Mazard. Tune into Financial Feels as my guests share their personal stories with money, the lessons they've learned, and the emotions they felt along the way. Money can often come with negative memories, especially when it comes to childhood trauma. In this episode, accredited financial counselor and financial trauma expert Rakim Sabri shares his journey on how he overcame his past traumas and is building a more enjoyable and secure future. This is a good one. So my earliest money memory, it was a birthday of mine, and my dad came to me and he asked me what I wanted. And I think I was getting ready to go into high school, so maybe middle school age. I just said, like, I wanted a new outfit. Like, I wanted a pair of jeans and a couple of shirts. At the time, I lived in New York, and so it was this, like, really popular store called VIM. I knew my dad was going to probably, like, take me to Fordham Road in the Bronx. We were going to go to VIM, going to get the jeans, a couple of shirts, maybe some sneakers. I realized that that moment, I started training myself to accept and expect less financially. When I say less, what I mean is like uh, quality and experiences because I didn't want to be disappointed by asking for the things that I really wanted and then being told that I couldn't have it or that it was an unreasonable request based off of where my parents were financially. So I'm the oldest of my siblings. I've always been kind of like the responsible, reasonable, logical child. I thought at the time I was doing my dad a favor by setting the bar relatively low in terms of what it is that I wanted. The reason why I had stumbled across this memory recently was because I started to dig into like, so what are some of the limiting beliefs that I have, particularly around money? And what I realized was that I had convinced myself that I was very simple, that I wanted the very basic of things as a defense mechanism for feeling that disappointment. I was born in the 90s, so growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, of course, we saw the rise of social media and, you know, the sophistication of the video game systems. I I remember the earliest video game system that me and my brother had was the Sega Genesis, and it was a second-hand version. So, you know, eventually we ventured into the PlayStation and we got the PlayStation 1 and the PlayStation 2. But it was always like you get the thing, but you don't get the accessory that comes with it. Right. So like maybe you're sharing a controller or maybe you can't afford the memory cards or whatever the extra thing was you didn't get. And so when I think about some of the things that maybe I wanted at that particular point in time as a kid, it probably was that I don't remember ever being you know, drawn to labels per se. I wasn't the kid who was asking for like, you know, the true religion jeans or, uh, you know, a pair of Jordan sneakers. But certainly if those were things that were accessible to us, I think maybe we would have asked for them just because, you know, kids start to learn about status at that age. They start to learn about, you know, well, what is cool and what's not cool and what makes you cool for having. And so where there's parts of that experience that I'm very grateful in that I didn't become super obsessed or obsessive about labels. I think certainly there were some internal, I don't want to call them pain points, but stops as it relates to how I viewed money and how I viewed people who demonstrated their money through status. I think that the values instilled in me as a child influenced whether or not I wanted to pursue like that level of flamboyance or flash, if you will. It wasn't something that I saw in my immediate family in terms of, you know, we got to have the nicest, newest this or whatever. Like there was a lot of secondhand experiences, a lot of secondhand items. I'll share this embarrassing kind of occurrence. There would be times where 
my dad, so when, when my mom, my dad, my siblings and I all lived in the same house, there were times when my dad would come in and he was like, there's a nice like piece of furniture on the corner. And so we would all have to like get up and go maybe late at night and, you know, drag the nice piece of furniture into our apartment. I remember feeling embarrassed about it because I'm like, we're like dumpster diving, like people got rid of it. And so it was like free, but it was just kind of like, mm, this is new. It's new to us, but it's not new. Right. Like, and there was kind of like no shame around that from my dad. It was just kind of like, all right, this is a nice thing. And no, this person doesn't want it. Or, you know, these people don't want it. So we're going to take it. We're going to clean it up and we're going to bring it into the house. And I was like, I don't want to be this person. Like, and I certainly don't want to be outside caught by somebody who knows me or recognizes me taking these items back into the house when they were very clearly sitting, you know, outside of the corner. But, you know, like I said, that was a reality for a little while. And in that, I internalized, like, it's not so much the material things that give us value. It's more so like the experiences and what can we do with family? I don't want to sound cliche, but like, how can we make a house a home, so to speak, right? Like, how can we fill our house with items or memories or things that allow for us to kind of appreciate each other's time together? There were pieces of furniture that it's like, oh, this this makes the house more comfortable. You know, now we can invite people over and we can have them sit. And like I said, I was I am the oldest of my siblings. So I think there's a level of responsibility that I internalized in that role that didn't allow for me to feel comfortable to just kind of splurge or be very impulsive with my money because I felt like all the decisions that I made, I was constantly being watched, whether that was from the, you know, authority figures in my life, parents, grandparents, whoever, or the younger people in my life who were looking up to me and the behaviors that I demonstrated. Biggest piece of advice that was given from my parents and other elders was to save. What is the reason why we're saving? So we become really good at this concept of taking some money or all of your money and putting it away. But then I think the lesson that needs to follow is what are you going to use that money for? Or what should you use that money for? How do you use that money responsibly? I mean, we would hear the things that I think most kids would hear like, oh, you know, as soon as you get that money, it's burning a hole in your pocket. Like you got to you got to put it away. You got to save it. My grandfather even got very like formulaic in terms of how much we should put away. He would say, you know, you would take a third and spend it on whatever you want. Take a third and invest it and take a third and save it. Again, I didn't understand well, what does that mean to invest it? You're talking about investing in companies as a kid. What company am I investing in? And taking the third and saving it. Well, you know, saving it for what? Say, you know, PlayStation 2 costs $250 and I'm getting five dollars every birthday or ten dollars every birthday like for me that was saving for a goal but then what happens when you reach that goal and then you spend all the money that you saved and now you're back to zero i think it's important that that lesson was shared but i think that there wasn't enough nuance or context around what the purpose of saving was for it to be something that really kind of carried me in my financial journey so I started working at the mall, started making my own money. I had spent it mostly on like necessities. So the store that I worked at was Sears. I was a cashier. So of course there was a dress code. So I needed to make sure that I had enough of the clothes, clothing items that matched the dress code for me to continue to go to work or wash the clothes, which cost money because we didn't have a wash and dryer machine. Uh, transportation. So I'm getting on the bus. Bus ride was probably, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. You know, you're thinking about the the time value of money there. Food. So if we're out, you're you maybe you get a 15, 20, 30 minute break, and um you you go to the food court, you try to buy something fast, but mall food is expensive. So you're spending your money on that every day. So I think, you know, a majority of the money that I was making, I was spending on being able to go into that work cycle, which 
ironically is kind of what we experience as adults right it was an introduction to what you experience as adult as adults instead of paying for the bus now paying for gas right instead of buying those uniform clothes you're buying these uniform clothes instead of making food at home you're going out and you're buying chick-fil-a or mcdonald's or whatever starbucks on your way into work so the socialization of money i think is really interesting when you you first start working as a teenager because you start to fall into those patterns and routines, and then they're reinforced as you get deeper into your own working experience. Certainly as an adult, your whole existence hopefully is not going to and from work and you know what you spend while you're there because you're making more. But at that particular point in time, I think that I just felt like an adult. I'm like, oh yeah, like I'm making my own money. I'm responsible for getting to and from work. So I got to spend this money I'm on transportation. I'm responsible for how I show up at work. So I got to spend this money on clothes. Oh, the place that I work at gives me a discount. Okay. I'm going to use that discount responsibly so that I can facilitate, you know, buying a black tie or, or whatever it is. And so I think more of the experience was on just kind of feeling accomplished as an adult and making my own money, even if there wasn't much left over, than on the fact that I was making money specifically. Freshman year of college, I went to St. Peter's. It was called St. Peter's College at the time at St. Peter's University now in Jersey City. My parents did not have a car. Getting out there was an ordeal. And then determining whether or not I would come home during weekends, holidays only, or, you know, just waiting till the end of the semester was kind of a challenge because in order for me to get home, I think at minimum, I had to take like three trains and it was a long commute, like easily two hours or more. And so sometimes it wasn't worth it financially. Most times, I mean, if I'm going to be honest, I don't think it was worth it financially, but it was just like, I don't want to be out here by myself. My student loans and the grants that I received through scholarships and through a school covered my tuition, my room and board, and had like maybe a surplus of like $260 at the end of it all. I opened up my... Um, not my first bank account, but my second bank account out there. There was a Chase representative came onto the campus and, you know, was signing people up. Chase was the only, or I want to say the only, but it was a local bank. Um, it was a bank that I could go into. So, like, established my first, like, big boy account there. Um, I had, like, a, save, a small savings account with a smaller bank from back home, but they didn't exist. And, like, there was no footprint over there. The thing that I remember the most about my freshman year of college was being hungry. I just remember like we had um, the meal plan where I could go into the cafeteria, but the cafeteria was open between, you know, X hours and X hours. So if you showed up and you ate, great. If you didn't show up and you didn't eat, well, that's it for you. And on weekends, the hours were less. And I think on some holidays, they were just not even open at all. There was like a school store. Um, market. As a part of the meal plan, you had a certain amount of like university cash, but that went very quickly because everything in the market was super expensive. And all of my friends, or well, most of my friends anyway, they had parents that were sending them money um, so they could go out and they could buy these things or they could go to, you know, the Chinese restaurant or the mall or whatever. And I didn't have that. I would go into some of my friends' rooms and I would see their their dorms be completely decked out with all this nice furniture and electronics. And they would have the mini fridge and the mini fridge would be packed with all of these different snacks and really relied on the mercy of some of those friends in kind of sharing their snacks with me because I just, I didn't have anything. I did a full year at St. Peter's. And then on one of the breaks, I went home and my mom let me know that she was considering moving to Texas. So I'm like, OK, what does that mean for me? Well, she's like, well, basically, like, what do you want it to mean for you? Do you want to come with me? Do you want to you know, stay here? So basically, she kind of like gave me and my siblings a choice. Like, do we want to stay with our dad in New York or do we want to go with her to Texas? She kind of like articulated the move as a new start. And so I was like, you know what, like, 
I'm going to take it. And it was one of the scariest decisions at that particular point in time in my life that I had ever made because I was leaving everything and everybody that I knew behind. But I was like, I'm going to go with my mom. I had withdrew from St. Peter's. I had started going to a community college that was um, local. So it was my first year and then the first semester after my first year. So the first semester of my sophomore year. And then we moved to Texas. I transitioned all of my classes to online. And um, and then we moved uh, in the fall of 2010. And so while I was out there, I was having a really hard time keeping up with classes because I'd never been in a fully remote environment before. I started like missing assignments or um, getting them in late. And so, you know, I wasn't performing well at all. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to transfer my credits now to UTSA because we live in San Antonio. And just as I was getting ready to kind of, because, you know, that's a convoluted process. Just as I was getting ready to start transferring my credits, my mom lets me know that her now fiance, the father of my, my brother, had got a job in Connecticut. And so we were all going to move up back north to Connecticut. So I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Drop everything that I'm doing. We move up to Connecticut. First thing I'm thinking is like, I need money. Like, I need to get a job. So I started working for a supermarket, which I hated. I applied to work at a bank as a part time teller and I had got it. And it was the most money that I ever made at one, at, you know, at any point in time in my life. I think it was like, they offered me $11.35 or something like that, or maybe eleven fifteen. I don't know, per hour. And I'm like, hell yeah, I'll take it. Like, let's do it. That's when life started for me. I did five months as a part-time teller before I got my first promotion. I was like, oh, this is what it feels like to get a promotion. Okay, I like this. I did six months in my next role before I got another promotion. And I just kind of became a rising star within the organization. So at that particular point in time, not only am I making more money than I've ever made before, but I'm learning about bank products and services, which also kind of spills over into understanding financial literacy. And I'm having conversations with all of these different people from different backgrounds on like the wealth spectrum. And I worked in what was referred to as a mass affluent market. So most of the clients that we had interfaced with were these professionals who, you know, were making good money, lawyers, doctors, accountants, entrepreneurs. And we would have to have conversations with them about, well, you know, what are you doing with your home equity? Do you own a home? Do you have any investments? What do your savings look like? And so as I'm learning to ask these questions, I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like, what is a home equity? What is a retirement account? Like, what does investments look like? Oh, you have a business account? What kind of business do you have? How do you structure that? And so as I'm learning all of these things, I'm like, man, I need to learn these things for me. I need to apply these things to myself. And so school kind of got the back burner for um, focusing on work and money. I did continue to go to school kind of part time until I think it was 2017, I graduated with my associate's degree. And then I was like, all right, I'm good. Like, I'm not I'm not going to keep up with the school. Like, I'm making more money than some of my friends who have bachelor's degrees right now. I'm in a good place. All of the attention is on me. Like, I'm a rock star in the company. I'm a rock star in the industry. That is kind of like how I got stuck in the banking world for 10 years. I've been complimented on my level of self-awareness, but I think there's only so much self-awareness you can have when it comes to where you've arrived to, particularly within the communities that you mentioned, right? FinCon community, Plutus community, financial therapy, financial counseling. Like, you know, sometimes I talk to people and they're like amazed by me and I'm like, oh, what did I do? Like, I did what I wanted. But, you know, being technical about it, so I spent a decade in the banking industry. In that time, that's where I started to learn about not only the financial products and services, but the mindset needed to be successful financially. I think the reason why that's a big deal is because when my mindset started to shift and I would bring back this information and my experiences to my community, that I would see shifts in other people's mindsets and other people's behaviors. And I was doing it really like organically. It wasn't like I was trying to monetize it at all. You know, monetization wasn't even a word in my vocabulary at that particular point in time. And then one day I decided that I wanted to write a book. So I wrote my first book, had nothing to do with finance. 
But people are like, oh, the money guy wrote a book. So people are buying the book because they're looking for financial information. And they're like, where's the stuff about the money? And I'm like, I'm not talking about money in this book. I'm talking about mentorship. That was something that, that is something that I'm passionate about. And then I wrote my second book the year after, which was about money, well, financially irresponsible. And as I was writing that book, I was preparing to deliver a TEDx talk. The timing on the publishing for the book compared to the TEDx talk was literally like a day apart. I published the book and then I did the TED talk. And so it was like a one-two punch. I had released a press release through some of the Black news wires and then Black Enterprise picked up the story about how I grew up experiencing section, you know, poverty with the Section 8 and the food stamps and I ended up buying my own home and I did the TEDx talk and the book. It was just like the perfect storm. And I just kept making noise, you know, going into 2020. I think I started writing for the Grio about personal finance. That's how I started to kind of like build my brand around there. And I was constantly looking for ways to, you know, plug back to financially irresponsible. And then I discovered the personal finance community that was not necessarily attached to FinCon, but maybe peripherally. Some people knew about it. I started making friends in the space, going on like this massive podcast tour. Just like any, I was like, anybody who has a podcast who wants to hear my story, I'm down. And they're like, oh, you you got a book? You did a TED Talk? You you bought a multifamily home? Like, I want to hear about it. One podcast led to another, led to another, and it just it became a thing. And I started creating content on social media. Instagram primarily, but moved into Twitter, moved into Facebook and, you know, all like LinkedIn, everywhere else. But at the time I was still working. And I think things really kind of like blew up for me in 2021 when I quit my job because it was during the Great Resignation. It was a really bold move. I had done all of these other things, the two books, the TEDx talk, the writing for publications, speaking, I think in maybe was between February and May, I found out that I was a speaker at FinCon 21. And I had like broadcasted it on my social medias and LinkedIn in particular. And my manager at the time was like, what is this about? Why are you doing this? What is your intentions with this? And I had just got my um, certified financial education instructor designation in February of 21. And so she felt like I was trying to make a move which I wasn't, but I was perfectly content to stay where I was at. I just wanted to do what I was doing, be left alone. I knew that I was going to come to a decision where I had to make either I'm going to commit to doing this work at the bank or I'm going to go do my own thing. And I was like, I'm too big to hide this now, right? Like I was writing for Entrepreneur, I was writing for The Grio. I was invited to speak at FinCon. I had the TEDx talk. I had the two books. Like, I'm like, I can't hide this. I made a decision to leave and I did it in a very like non-conventional way. I was like effective immediately. I'm out. Like I quit and I tweeted that and the tweet goes viral. And so many people are congratulating me and reaching out and like celebrating this, like, oh, this was so brave of you and so courageous. And next thing I know, business insider is running the story. Uh, Entrepreneur ran the story. The Grio ran the story. Uh, Bigger Pockets Money reached out to me and was like, do you want to talk about this on our podcast? Tamron Hall, the uh, producer from Tamron Hall show, reached out to me and was like, do you want to talk about this on our show? And I'm like, this is not real. Like, there's no way. And that's how a lot of people kind of like found out about me. I was like, all right, I'm going to continue to plug the stuff that I have. Like during 2020, when the whole George Floyd murder occurred, Robert Kiyosaki went on Twitter and made some comments about the protesters. And I wrote an open letter to him through the Grio, And that went viral. So a bunch of people found me through that. And um, and I just I've been building community ever since. I think that's how like I started to get known. And I have a way about talking about my experience with money as a black man, as a millennial that acknowledges the experience of Black people. And that's how I kind of stumbled onto the financial trauma term. And I started using that probably towards uh, maybe the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. In 2022, I went to FinCon in person. It was 21 I did virtually. And then the month after that, I went to Financial Therapy Association's conference in person. 
And then a month after that, I went to the AFCPE's conference in person. And so, of course, I'm meeting all of these people and I'm talking about the stuff that I talk about. And they're like, you're on to something. I stayed on the thing that people really like. So my message transitioned from this idea of, you know, just financial empowerment into financial trauma and acknowledging that, well, financial trauma stops you from feeling financially empowered. So let's deal with the financial trauma and let's talk about it from a lens that is not just you have to work harder, you have to learn more, you have to, you know, it's your fault and talk about it from a systemic structural perspective. And um, and I didn't have vocabulary to describe the things that I talk about now, right? Like now I understand systems theory. I knew what systems theory was because of my lived experience and the education that I had, but I didn't I didn't know that it was called systems theory, right? I didn't I didn't know how to describe financial trauma until I started using the phrase and I got involved with the Financial Therapy Association, these other organizations. So it seems like it happened overnight. But it's been kind of like this very long, like cumulative learning experience that has transitioned from my lived experience and my ability to articulate that lived experience without the vocabulary that I have now into being able to support those experiences with the sophistication of vocabulary and community that has come with getting involved with these different organizations and really having my voice amplified. I've always been a writer. Um, I haven't always liked writing, though. Um, so that's, that's I think, an interesting kind of tidbit. But I read two books, actually. At the beginning of like my content creation journal, it was Crushing It by Gary Vee. Basically, he talks about like the different ways to create content and repurpose your content, and, you know, be authentic and all that. And a book called Platform by Sophia Johnson. And in the book platform, Cynthia Johnson talks about how to really create a personal brand. Both Gary Vee and Cynthia Johnson talk about it, the importance of creating a personal brand. But Cynthia Johnson really kind of talks about, like, how do you establish yourself as an authority or an expert? And one of the things that she talked about was writing. And so I was like wait a second, like I could write for like a business insider or an entrepreneur. And I went, started looking how to, you know, reverse engineer this process. I took a couple of courses, joined a couple of masterminds. Like, I, I mean, I definitely invested in the education, understanding, like, how do you pitch a publication? Who do you pitch? When you structure your pitch, how do you demonstrate expertise in this particular area, right? You don't want to be pitching for every different topic just because and so the area that I could with the most authority speak to was personal finance, right? I could speak to 10 years or not at the, at the time it wasn't 10 yet, but almost 10 years of presence in the space. I could speak to, you know, having a book about personal finance. I could speak to having the TEDx talk. Those were like my big pieces of credibility. Once I got my first piece out, it was like, all right, like now you just ladder it, do another piece and another piece and another piece. And so I've written for anybody that you would want to write for. Business Insider, The Grio, Black Enterprise, Money.com, Entrepreneur, Forbes. That's my baby right now, right? Like when I first started writing, I said, I want to write for Forbes. Like that's the goal. And it took me a couple of years to get there, but it took all of those small steps or checking off those boxes to position myself to be able to approach Forbes and have them say yes, because I've approached them before and they said no. I approached them a couple of times and they said no. When you are writing for a Forbes or a business insider or an entrepreneur, people view you as an expert. They view you as the expert on whatever it is that you're writing about. And so they will seek you out to come speak or maybe not as much now, I've had some people reach out to me and they're like, hey, we want to pay you to come talk about what you talk about in your articles. But it's not been like, uh, oh, my God, my life has changed because somebody read the right person read my article. But it, it is a thing that happens. Podcast is a thing now. Platform came out a while ago. So podcast wasn't as popular as it is now. But I've had a lot of people reach out to me to be on their podcast because of it. I think the authority that comes with these publications 
is what the draw is to really kind of establishing yourself as a thought leader on whatever the topic is. Because you got to think about who's the audience, right? Who's reading Forbes? Who's reading Entrepreneur? Where are they in terms of their career trajectory? Where are they in terms of their decision-making power? Where are they in terms of their income? This is going to sound terrible, but you're not having high school graduates go and read Forbes. Well, that's not who Forbes is catering their content to. They're catering their content to, you know, mid-level or C-suite level executives, entrepreneurs, people with bachelor's and master's level degrees, people who are making significant income, you know, and talking to those audiences, I would not get in front of that population any other way. I think my advice would be to get started. It's important to know what you want your end goal to be, but it's also important to not get so fixated on the end goal that you forget to do the small things that it takes for you to to move in that direction. Me buying the course, participating in the masterminds, reading those books, those help me conceptualize the goal, but then actually putting in the reps, you know, writing for myself writing on Medium. I mean, I have my own newsletter even to this day, writing on Substack, writing on social media, like developing the skill as a writer is something that I've had to do over time. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to wake up one day and I'm going to write for Forbes. Because even then, even when you get to a place where you can write for these publications, they're going to want to see that you can actually write. And I think a lot of people, especially in the age of chat GPT, want to outsource some of these skill sets so that they can just say that they have the name, right? Forbes, entrepreneur, whoever. But I'll use ChatGPT, but I won't use ChatGPT to write my articles. Um, You're not allowed to, but even if you were allowed to, like there's a certain level of pride that I take with how I can articulate myself through writing that wouldn't allow for me to do that. And so I think the question that people need to ask themselves when they are thinking about embarking on kind of a similar journey is, why do you want to do this? Um, Or do you actually want to do this? Or is it just because you want to be associated with the name? And all of my media mentions have been organic. I've never paid for media. I had a conversation with a friend recently, and they asked me, I'm really interested in understanding your writing process, because for me, it starts with speaking. I will record myself saying what it is that I want to discuss during the writing, and then I would transcribe it. And I said, that's interesting because my process for speaking is exactly the opposite. I will write down what it is that I want to say in a speaking environment, and then I will transition it into a more kind of organic feeling speaking. So they go hand in hand. I can speak and write, But I just know that my strength leans more towards writing than it does towards speaking. I'm an introvert as well. So when it comes to the energy exchange that occurs as a speaker versus as a writer, all I got to do is write it and then put it out into the world. People keep reading it. It's not taking any more energy from me versus when I speak, particularly if I'm speaking with a large audience. You're interacting with all of those energies at once. And then people want to approach you afterwards and they want to talk to you. And and I love all of that, but I'm just conscious of how it impacts my energy in that moment and in the moments to follow. I think determining what is the way in which the content serves you best is important. Certainly there are ways to build authority through speaking that maybe are just as effective as writing. It's just for me, writing has been like my thing. And so um, I've leveraged that to allow for me to speak and to allow for me to consult and um, show up in the different ways that I show up. That has been really like my baseline. I thought that money avoidance was the money script that I subscribe to to this day, because when you look at the journal that um, Dr. Brad Klontz and company published around the different money scripts. Statistically, my upbringing would land me in the money avoidance script. And for a long time, I was money avoidant. I I think we spent a good time talking about that today. But recently, I took a quiz. I have to find the resource 
where you could take a quiz that basically ask you a series of questions around money and how you interact with money, what you believe about it, et cetera. And the script that came back with the highest score for me today was money worship, which I thought was really interesting. And so money worship is kind of like the idea that if I had more money in my life, that all my problems would be solved. And so it will ask you questions like, just like that. Like, you know, if you have more money, would your problems go away? I forget all of them. So I would just be burning time trying to remember. But it's very interesting to me because I was like, I've never been the, the guy to place so much value on, on money, on material things. What I realized, though, is that there are a couple of things that influence that outcome. One is that um, as a full-time entrepreneur with fluctuating income, that more money in my life would solve all my problems. So my answers are not like wrong. It's just, it's reflective of what it is that I'm experiencing right now. And then also because I've graduated from the scarcity associated with money avoidance, now I'm in a place where I'm allowing myself to align my values with spending more, right? Having better experiences, flying first class, going to different places, wanting the more expensive clothing item or accessory, right? looking at things like Rolexes and, you know, not from a position of, I think it's very easy to kind of confuse money worship with money status, not from a position of I have this thing. And so it makes me better than somebody else, but from a position of for so long, I told myself I couldn't have this and now I want it. I don't think that any of the money scripts in and of themselves are bad. I think that it lets you know where you kind of are fixating on money so that you can be self-aware and make adjustments as needed. Certainly, if money status was the script that I'm most closely aligned to, then that would be even more surprising. Hold on a second. Like, what does this mean? But money status could speak to comfort, right? I could say, oh, well, instead of driving a Nissan, I want to drive a Lexus, right? Like, there is a quality that comes with this luxury vehicle that doesn't come with the other one. It looks like on the outside that I want this because of other people to prove to other people that I've arrived. And maybe that maybe that might be the case, but it doesn't make me a bad person necessarily. I say this often. I mean, I mean it with all my heart, like as much as it's about the money, it's not. Self-awareness is important. Normalizing wealth is important. By extension, I think mentorship is important. Just being exposed to people who have and do and think differently is going to have a huge impact on what you can even see as being feasible. I had a mentor that I acquired uh, this year who has completely like changed the way that I view money. And I'm like, man, like, I'm an expert on this topic. And even being an expert on this topic, like there's things that I just didn't consider, right? Like even what I shared with you earlier on around recognizing the limiting beliefs that I have around money came about as a result of a conversation that we had. And also I would say like most of the stuff that we see online is it's just not real. I think it's so easy to fall into the trap of comparing where you are in your financial journey with whoever, Joe Schmo online or or Rakim Sabri online, right? And say like, man, like I want to do what Rakim did and not realizing all of the variables that went into the decisions that I've made. I'm just using myself as an example, but all the variables that went into the decisions that I've made over the course of my financial life, deciding to go to college and then get out to go move to Texas, right? Like deciding to go as far as my associate's degree and then stop so that I could keep making money at the bank, deciding to quit my job at the bank so that I could pursue entrepreneurship. Like there are so many variables behind the scenes that yes, people can applaud me for the courage that I've had in those moments and for the transparency and sharing those moments. But there's so much more than people see. 
I would not want somebody to follow those footsteps without understanding that. I wouldn't want somebody to follow those footsteps, even if they did understand that. I'm going to be 100% real just because a lot of that came with sacrifice. A lot of that came with fear, overcoming fear. A lot of that came with the support system that I have or don't have came from the money scripts and stories that I've witnessed, observed, picked up, collected, integrated into my own life. So there's a lot of success on, you know, this side of Rakim's experience. There's a lot that has come with what that success has, has looked like. And so I think the most important thing for me to share is, you know, that level of transparency, right? Like your journey is your journey and the decisions that you make are going to be the right decisions for you. Nobody else can make those decisions for you. People can give you guidance, but you have to ultimately walk through the door. All of my social media is my name, at Rakim Sabri, R-A-H-K-I-M-S-A-B-R-E-E. No hyphens, underscores, periods, spaces. My website is rakimsabri.com. You can find me there. My substack is rakimsabri.substack.com. So I send out a pretty weekly, sometimes I take breaks, but pretty weekly newsletter on Substack. And then Forbes, you can find me, just type my name into Forbes, Rakim Sabri, and then my author page will come up and all the articles that I wrote. Thank you, Rakim, for being open with us and for sharing about the growth you've experienced in your mindset and finances along your journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know with a review and stay tuned for the next one.